So, good morning. So, what we are presenting today is part of a larger project. So, we are going to present today some preliminary findings. And for the title of this presentation, which was Learner Statement and Linguistic Development During Study Abroad, a comparison of socio pragmatic development among university students and au pairs in home state contexts. So before I actually start presenting the study, I'll just give you an overview of what uh, we are going to do in the next 20 minutes. So we are, we are working on socio-pragmatic development and, and in particular we will actually mention why we chose some particular linguistic phenomena. And we select some particular items and then we will present the study and then say some of the preliminary findings. Okay, so we are working with, um, on pragmatic markers. They have been referred in many ways in linguistics and two of the most popular are pragmatic markers uh, or discourse markers and in particular we are endorsing these two scholars, Adam and Simon van der Berger, and we, we cla which claim that, who claim that discourse markers is just a way of um, signaling coherence relations whereas pragmatic markers is a sort of hypernym so encompassing the first one. And then also um, there are items that signal in the communication the, uh, and guide the addressee interpretation. Okay, it's a very large class of linguistic elements which can be used either as a pragmatic markers and in their canonical function. So for instance, if we take, you know, for instance, you can, we can say that you know that in Isla, for instance, that the weather is kind of miserable, and when I arrived here, you know, I was very surprised and happy as well. <laughs> and at some, they have been defined in very negative ways. So they have been claimed to have a known throat conditional value, that of being positionally flexible, and this has led some scholars to say that if they can be deleted without affecting the propositional content of the utterance, they are probably pragmatic markers. But if we actually delete them from the utterance, the context is not exactly the same. So, okay. So why do we think that they can be interesting in a study abroad perspective? Uh, apparently, native speakers use them very, very frequently. Whereas learners probably do not, especially classroom learners. And some scholars like Sanktov and Al claim that uh, learners can actually acquire those expression with contact with native speakers. And so Miga, in a very recent uh, work, uh, claimed that they can be considered as an index of level exposure to the target language. So, as I was saying, very huge category. So we select three for this presentation. So like, well, and you know. And our choice was based on the theoretical framework of some work by Irish dialectologists, as well as some studies on pragmatic markers in English. So Raymond Hickey claimed that like and you know are feature of Irish English as pragmatic markers. And we found out that well is one of the most frequently investigated pragmatic markers in second language acquisition. And then we corroborated those with the findings on a, on a corpus that is already there. It's Spice Island, and it's a corpus of Irish English. And we just wanted to know if they are really very frequent in Irish English, so that, because if they're very frequent, the probably learners are more exposed to this linguistic phenomena. And Spice is part of ICE, an so international corpus of English, and it's the spoken component. And what is very interesting about it, it's pragmatically annotated in terms of speech acts and pragmatic discourse markers. So basically it was quite easy to get this and so you know well and like were also one of the most frequent ones also according to the three corpora. So basically what were well, well, our research questions? So the first one I think is quite obvious. We were interested to see what is the effect of the study abroad context on the use of this linguistic phenomena. And another thing that we were interesting to see is that are different kinds of study abroad experience uh, um, going to lead to different linguistic outcomes? And so we were interested in their learner status in the target language community. And then we actually compared the, um, 
the results with the corpus of native speaker to see so if in terms of uses there are any differences. So we conducted the longitudinal analysis. We met the learners when they arrived in Ireland. So that's T1, time one. And before they left the country, T2. And the language saved six months and we conducted the interviews following the principle of the sociolinguistic interview. And the comparative analysis was with uh, Erasmus students and au pairs. So I don't know if you know this kind of experience, but au pairs are learners as well. And they decided to come to go to to learn English. And at the same time, they were attending part-time English courses as well as living and working for an Irish family. So their comparison was based on their status or raison d'etre. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> so, and yeah, and so just because we were interested, in so different kind of exposure can have some implication in their, uh, the language they are going to be exposed to and they're going to produce as well. So to investigate use, we extract the example with AntConc, which is a software used in corpus linguistics. And then we actually had to manually encode each example. So that's an example of AntConc. So the, what we actually um, added so was, uh, first of all, we, decide, uh, we had to decide if uh, the item was used in the canonical use of a pragmatic marker in order to calculate this index of pragmatic value, which is the ratio between pragmatic and non-pragmatic uses. And then we try to assess the pragmatic function in context following uh, Beach in 2016. <coughs> so I'll try to be very quickly about that. So basically, according to this classification, like can be used as a focuser, a sort of highlighter of what is coming next. And, and according to Raymond Hickey, this is very common in Irish English. It can be used as a quotative, as in order to uh, introduce something the speaker would have said or has said uh, in that circumstances as an exemplifier to introduce an example. And this is one of the functions that is more close to the core meaning of like in the canonical use as an approximator, both for numbers and also for concepts as a hedge to mitigate uh, what is being said. And in addition to that, I found out that uh, both native speakers and non-native speakers use that as a mere filler. And uh, no native speaker use it as, as a word search. With regard to the other two, you know, it's used as a filler, just to, in a citation. When the speaker is trying to search for a word, introduce a clarification or initiate a new topic for getting the attention of the speaker. And as a repair, more or less like I mean, but in a more covert way. And also to show a self evident truth. Generally, in the right periphery, the speaker is basically saying something is so evident to him that it's a sort of self tautology. Well, as well as a, as a filler to new hesitation as a marker of transition. So the speaker basically is gathering up what the other one has said and basically introduce what he's going to say by well. Uh, oh. Okay, <laughs> so as a mean of topic change or raising an objection, as a way of introducing this preferred response, basically a polite way of saying no, and a polite way of taking the turn as a self-repair and also as a quotative. So, I'll go to the sample now. So the sample we relied on was quite small. Uh, we had eight Erasmus students and eight au pairs, but of course we interviewed them in two times. And the average age was about 23 years of age. And then we had five native speakers and about 25 years of age. Uh, the interviews last on average, uh, where is it? okay, 50 minutes. And um, yeah, so the learners were from Italy and for the Erasmus we had five females and three males and for the au pairs we had unfortunately just females because it's a kind of experience that is more common among females, although it's getting you know, popular among males as well. And we had in both 
corpora, three students of modern languages and students of other disciplines. So, what we found out. So, the first thing that we actually noted was, was an increase in the normalized frequencies, so what I'm referring to as rate here, and the pragmatic uses, so the index of pragmatic value. So as you can see, from time one to time two, there was an increase in all cases. And in the case of you know, um, this approach of the native speakers once. Uh, for the rate, just for the Erasmus students actually went closer to that. The OPERS increased, but it was not at the same extent. <coughs> With regard to like, uh, there was an increase also in this case, although they didn't approach native speakers' uh, index of pragmatic end rate as well. And for well, I have to say that although, according to SPICE, is a very frequent marker, it was not that frequent in uh, my corpus. And because the rate, even for native speaker, is, was not that high. But maybe it's because we do the fact that we use the, the kind of instrument that we use. And, so. and then, um, different pragmatic uses. Um, yeah, so there was an increase, but also there was they used them differently. For the Erasmus student, there was not an extensive change apart from the increase in the top um, 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 functions. With regard to the au pairs, what is interesting is that in time two, we have self-evident truth that was not very much used in time one. You can't actually see that, you know, all the list now, but that's what happened. And with regard to like, it's interesting that both groups start using this function, which was claimed to be quite popular in Irish English. In time two, we had diff uh, time one, we had different kind of ex things uh, for both groups, but that was something that happened in time two. And for well, different kind of experience uh, of results in time one, but in time two, both the Erasmus <coughs> students and the au pairs use that as an hesitation. And for the au pairs, it's more than 50% of use. So then we compared that to the uh, small corpus of native speakers. And what we found out was that, well, it was used by the native speaker mainly as a transition and self-correction. In time two, both the au pairs and the learners use that as a filler and which was not very much used by the native speakers. Uh, for you know, native speakers use that many to introduce a clarification, but learners still use that as a way of introducing, uh, just as a filler, which was common among the native speakers, but not the most frequent one. But for like, we had some similarities and differences. We had that the use of like, uh, focus or like was quite widespread between native speakers and non-native speakers, although the rates were different. Uh, but learners also use that like in a very in a um, learner-like way, probably with, if we allow me, because they use that to search for words, which was not present in the native speaker corpus. So some preliminary tentative conclusion well, regarding that. So definitely there was an effect because there was an increase uh, in the normalized frequency and an either high, um, index of pragmatic value, different pragmatic using time too. We also assess a high individual variation that unfortunately we were not able to present here, so that is something that needs to be done. But as a group, there were not very extensive differences. I mean, uh, at least from, uh, we noticed that some learn the learners and both uh, Erasmus students and the au pairs managed to acquire some markers that uh, were claimed to be typical of Irish English. But after the study abroad experience, we also noted that for the use of you know and well, basically they use it mainly as a filler. And I'll finish off that and thank you.